Over the past two months, my wife has rekindled her close relationship with her sister Helen. Before this, we would see Helen and her not-so-bright husband maybe three times a year. Now it's become a weekly occurrence. Helen used the time together to vent about her husband and how he's messing up. It got me thinking about what my wife might be saying about me. A needle and thread aren't exactly tools I usually wield. My mom used them because she sewed quilts when I was a kid and thought it would be useful for me to learn, even though I was a boy. Fast forward 30 years, and I found I remembered how to use a needle and thread. Welcome to the Dark Side channel. Dive into the world of human relationships, mistakes, and right decisions. Don't miss out. Subscribe and join our growing community. From a small box usually tucked at the bottom of the toolbox, I pulled out a tiny device resembling a small white button. It matched the other six buttons on my wife's favorite silk blouse. With tiny scissors, I snipped off the original button, removed all the threads from where the button was, and sewed the device in its place. I hung the blouse on a hanger and took it to our bedroom, placing it back where it was before. I could hear the shower running in our bathroom. Quietly, I returned to my home office and opened my laptop. Opening a new program and entering the password, I displayed a photo of our bedroom on the screen. I played with the remote control until I heard the sound of the shower and could clearly see the bedroom. I listened through headphones. I heard the shower turn off and the hairdryer come on. A few minutes later, my naked wife entered the bedroom and began dressing for dinner with her sister. I watched. She pulled on stockings with garters and a skirt. She put on low-heeled shoes. From the desk drawer, she retrieved a satin bra and started to put it on, paused to apply a bit of perfume to each nipple, then put on the bra. She slipped into a silk blouse. If she notices the replaced button, it'll be only when she touches it. She didn't notice anything. She didn't put on panties. Watching her, I wondered, why no underwear? Why perfume the nipples? The desire to know what she and Helen talked about led me to learn more about my wife than I had anticipated. Buttoning up her blouse, she sat at the vanity table and attended to her face and hair. I watched. The camera in the button was angled at the mirror, and I saw it all. When she was ready, she glanced at the clock, took her cell phone out of her purse, and dialed a speed dial number. At eight o'clock by the ocean, outside by the main entrance. She dialed a new speed dial number and said, Remember, don't answer the house phone until I call your mobile. Thanks, sis. She tossed the phone back into her bag and stood up. I pressed a few keys, and iTunes and Dave Brubeck appeared on the screen. Lisa walked into my office and kissed me on the cheek. I took off my headphones and asked, When will you be back? No later than 10.30. We all have work tomorrow. Don't wait up. Okay, say hi to Helen for me. She nodded and waved as she left the house. I turned on the monitoring program again. She turned on the radio in the car and hummed along to a song until she was almost at the beach. She parked and took her cell phone out of her purse, and I watched as she set it to vibrate and tossed it back in. If I didn't suspect her, this would be fun. I wanted to shut off the computer and not know what she was up to, but I couldn't stop watching. She got out of the car and headed to the restaurant at the end of the pier. We'd never been there. Instead of going inside, she stood in the shade where she could watch the main entrance. I glanced at the clock, 7.58. Movement caught my eye on the screen. From around the corner of the restaurant, a man appeared. He looked around and headed straight for Lisa. When he was about ten feet away from her, I snapped a photo of him and started recording. Any trouble? He asked. No, she replied. They both glanced around, seeing that no one was watching, and kissed. They walked out onto the pier. As they walked, they talked. I adjusted the volume. Do you have a plan? Lisa asked. I think so. Last time I saw Pete was a month ago. I weighed 190 pounds. Today I'm 180. When I hit 170, I'll have lunch with him and tell him I have cancer. She turned to him, looking concerned. Isn't that dangerous? I heard the worry in her voice. No. When I hit 160, he'll ask if you can do something for me. I'll casually joke that he could let me sleep with you. If he agrees, we're in the clear. Once he's given me permission to have you, he's given it all away. I think he'll go for it. He's very kind. He smiled. 
a dying man's last wish. They stopped in a nearly dark part of the pier and kissed. His hands unbuttoned her blouse and shifted the camera so I couldn't see what he was doing anymore. Lisa was kind enough to provide commentary. After a minute, she said, And the second one? The camera moved, she moaned, and I heard a wet sound, again and again. I'm not wearing panties, she whispered. Oh my God! Bill, take it easy. Yes, right here. Let's book a room somewhere next week. Can you take the afternoon off? We could drive miles away from here and even use a bed, Bill suggested. On Tuesday. I can take the second half of the day off on Tuesday. Then we'll have a couple of hours and we can do everything properly again, he said. He led her to a picnic table and she sat on the edge. He lifted her legs and they engaged in sex. They heard a noise and Bill lowered her legs and turned away from the sound. She covered her naked body and stood next to the table. Bill checked the time and started buttoning up his shirt. After four more kisses, they walked back to the restaurant. He turned left and disappeared. She walked past the restaurant and got into her car. On the way home, she chewed and swallowed six mint candies. When she turned onto Washington Avenue, I shut down the computer and went to bed. She came in and undressed in the bathroom. I heard the water running in the sink, then the toilet flushing. She climbed into bed wearing my t-shirt and panties. I pretended to be asleep until she got into bed. Then I woke up and asked, How's Helen? She's fine. I think she's mad at Gordon, but she didn't want to talk about it. That's unusual. Being mad at Gordon is all she usually talks about. She kissed me, rolled over to the other side, and fell asleep. I felt nauseous. That mouth kissed me after Bill's penis. I lay awake for over an hour, pondering. When I woke up, Lisa had already showered and dressed for work. I went through my ritual and was ready by the time we walked out the door together. Throughout the day, whenever I wasn't heavily focused on work, I found myself thinking about my wife and my best friend. This was the guy who stood by me at our wedding. I needed a plan. I needed to know why they were doing this to me. Was I really such a bad friend? Such a bad husband? Did I deserve this? During lunch, I sat with six other guys. Most of them were around my age. I mentioned I had borrowed a tape, and the show was about a guy who found out his wife was cheating. The guy in the movie took his wife to a therapist, and by the end of the show, they seemed to be okay. This sparked a discussion. I learned things about the guys I'd worked with for ten years that I didn't know. Once I was married to Beth, John Kingsley said, three years in, I found out she'd been screwing her boss for five years. The whole time we were together, she was banging her boss. We didn't go to a therapist. I found out on Wednesday, and by the weekend I had an apartment, and I was out. The pain was still fresh and raw in his voice, even though he'd been married to Alice for five years. Across from him sat Louis, the elder in our team. He was 42. If she agreed to be faithful when you got married, then the first time she fucks another man's, you're no longer married. All bets are off. It's like sports. When the ball leaves the court, it's all over. So, you're divorcing her, kicking her to the curb. He looked up again and said, Why do I need a piece of paper? If she wants a divorce, she can pay for it. I'm gone. The day after I find out my woman is with someone else, you won't see me here, I'll be gone. Hank spoke up. In church, they tell us to understand. They talk about forgiveness. Don't you want to know why? Does knowing the temperature of ice change how it feels? Louis asked. I nodded. Bob Thomas stood up. Lunch is over, he said. We all returned to work. I pondered. What difference did it make why Lisa was sleeping with Bill? If the pipe in my house is clogged, I don't care why. I just want it fixed. If there's a fire in the house, will I spend time figuring out its cause? Hell no, I just want the fire put out. I struggled all day. Then I called Lisa's sister. I called her at work. She answered professionally, but when she realized it was me, her voice changed. Friendly, not professional. Hey, Helen, I need your help. Lisa's birthday is coming up soon and I want to make it special. Can we sit down and brainstorm something? I feel like I need some help. I'll help. When? Can you make it free on Tuesday during the day? I knew Lisa would be busy. Of course. Where should we meet? Any good restaurant near where you work. Quiet, well lit, and good food. Got it. How about on the beach? It's actually a restaurant on the beach where the chairs are in the sand. Perfect. Noon? I'll mark it down. 
Don't write lunch with Pete. If Lisa sees that, she'll figure it out and ruin the surprise. I'll put down lunch with Sandy. She spent ten minutes telling me about what her husband had planned. They'd been together for two years longer than we had, and he'd messed up so many things that I was amazed this guy could walk into a room. And yet, Helen stayed. Something kept her in a relationship that clearly wasn't working. I volunteered to work on Saturday. On Sunday, I took care of household chores. Deep down, I knew the house would soon be put up for sale. Lisa tried to convince me to go to the movies on Sunday evening. She wanted us to have dinner and go to a movie about an hour and a half's drive from home. The same movie was showing in a theater less than 15 minutes away. When she told me which restaurant she wanted to go to, I knew it would be at least $30 for entry, and she'd want wine and dessert. I asked her if this treat was on her or me. She decided we could stay home and watch something on cable. We sat at home and watched a movie on cable. It was called Breakup. When it was over, I asked, Why bother getting married? They acted like two married people, bickering over nothing and doing everything they could to ruin their own lives. Men just don't know how to listen, she said, with a tone and body language that conveyed what she said was more than an opinion. It was a fact. There must be some naturals out there who know how to listen, otherwise there would be 80% lesbians in the world. With the invention of vibrators and silicone, I bet the percentage has gone up, Lisa said. If our marriage fell apart, would you want to get married again? To me? She stopped. She held two empty Diet Cola cans and an empty popcorn bowl in her hands and was heading to the kitchen. She turned around and asked, What? Answer my question. Lately I've been feeling like you're not happy in our marriage. If not, let's sell the house, split the money and kiss goodbye. Her eyes filled with tears. I thought you were happy. I thought the same until I felt like you'd rather be somewhere else. I wasn't the one who went to work yesterday, Saturday. A good distraction tactic. Shifting the conversation to a singular incident instead of staying on topic. Yes, I worked yesterday. You didn't mention doing anything together on Saturday. Last Saturday, you spent the whole day at your sister's. Then you had dinner with her late in the week. That tells me you'd rather be with her. Honestly, it's okay. Maybe you'll move in with her and Gordon. I know he'd like you to be close. That's awful. I don't like Gordon at all. Maybe you and Helen can buy dildos and batteries together and have each other without men. You don't understand. I sat on the couch. I patted the spot next to me and said, Sit here and explain it to me. I have a master's degree in natural sciences. Maybe I can understand if you explain it simply enough. Now you're speaking with sarcasm. No, I want to understand. The only person I know who can help me understand is you. I can't think of anything on this planet or any other that would be as important to me as understanding this. I patted the couch again. She took a step closer to the couch and said, You won't be able to understand women. Liza, I don't care about understanding women in general. I want to understand you. I don't care why Helen stays with Gordon. I don't care why movie stars stay married or not. I care about you and me. We watched a movie, and it somehow upset you. I don't want to live like a lesbian with my sister. I don't want to sell the house and kiss each other goodbye. She walked to the kitchen. I heard the popcorn going into the trash, the cans into the disposal, and the bowl into the dishwasher. She walked through the living room and into the bedroom. Twenty minutes later, she silently climbed into bed in my shirt and underwear. I was already there, lying on my back. She turned off the light and rolled onto her side, facing away from me. I'll call the real estate agency in the morning. I rolled onto my side and didn't say anything until morning. She didn't say anything either. Arriving at work, I called a familiar realtor and pointed out our house. I had a long lunch and met her at the house. We set a good price for it. She explained to me what I needed to do to increase the selling price, and we parted ways, shaking hands. As I backed out of the driveway on my way to work, I saw a for sale sign on the lawn in front of the house. Lisa leaves work half an hour before I do. I turned off my cell phone when she left work. Exiting the car, I drove home obeying all traffic rules. Turning onto our street, I saw the realtor sign covered with a green plastic garbage bag. I smiled. 
I parked in the garage, returned to the yard, and removed the bag from the sign. I entered through the back door. Lisa was in our bedroom, face down on the bed. I entered the bathroom, closed the door, and relieved myself. I blushed, washed my hands, and opened the door. Lisa was sitting on the edge of the bed, on my side. I kept walking. When I reached the door, she said, I want to live with you. I don't believe you. I continued walking. In the kitchen, I grabbed a diet soda and a small pack of cookies. In the living room, I sat on the couch and turned on the news. I never watched the news. Lisa walked in and sat at the other end of the couch. Two minutes passed and only the sound from the TV filled the room. Can we talk? She asked. About what? I replied. I don't want to sell the house. I don't want to kiss you goodbye. Who do you want to kiss? I asked, turning to face her. I noticed a momentary change in the color of her face before she composed herself and said, No one. Okay, I'll leave that for now. Do you want to live with me? I'm your wife. Of course I want to live with you. You're not helping me understand you. You act like something's wrong with me and maybe it's contagious, but then you say you want to stay. Am I treating you poorly? You're not treating me poorly. It's much worse. You're not treating me at all. You don't want me to leave, and you don't want me to be your husband. You could save us, but you can't bring yourself to do it. She sat and watched as I got up from the couch and headed to our bedroom. I grabbed another pillow and blanket, took them to the spare room, and threw them on the bed. I knew she knew what I was doing. I returned to the bedroom and closed the door behind me. I took a shower and went to bed. It wasn't even nine yet. Close to ten, Lisa opened the door and walked in. I usually sleep facing the door, so I immediately saw her come in. She was naked. This was serious. In the dim light, her naked form still sets fire. She quietly crept to her side of the bed. She lifted the blanket and began to climb in. Stop! I turned on the lamp and faced her. For a whole month, every night you come to bed in your panties and t-shirt. You sleep with your back to me, and only once in that month have I gotten a goodnight kiss. I put a pillow and extra blanket in the other bedroom. If you want to sleep in this house, sleep there. I want to sleep with you. Tough. I made a mistake, but I have no idea what I did. I made a mistake with you. You know what the mistake was? You've been punishing me for it for a while, but you won't tell me what I did or didn't do. I'm left with only one choice. Sell the house, get divorced, and let you be happy with someone else. I don't want to be happy with someone else. And you don't want to be happy with me. I give up. I retract my statement that I'm left with only one choice. Sell the house, get divorced, and let you be unhappy with someone else. I got out of bed and turned on the overhead light. I looked at Lisa and asked, Do you love me? Until that moment, she had been looking straight at me. The instant I asked her, she looked away for a second. I had my answer. In that moment, I understood that if we weren't married, if we weren't bound by love, we would be having sex. She stood exactly as she had since I said, stop. I lifted the sheet and blanket and said, lie down on the bed and spread your legs. I knew we had condoms for our guests in the other bedroom, so I went and got them. When I returned, she was lying on her back in bed. Her eyes looked frightened. I tossed her the condom. You came to bed naked to persuade me to stay with sex, not to sell the house and keep telling yourself you love me. Okay, here's your chance. She complied and used her skills. A hundred times I told myself sleeping with her was fine. Maybe Bill wasn't the only one she had sex with. My anger, disappointment, and rage helped me. When I was aroused, I said, Okay, Lisa, spread your legs for me. Can we turn off the light, please? No, I might want to remember this, and I want the images to be vivid and clear. Don't you like watching? I plunged into her, driving as fast and fiercely as my pleasure dictated. After throwing a box of tissues to her from the bathroom, I took a shower to compose myself. I turned off the light and lay down in bed. If you want, you can stay here for the night. But first, you have to answer one question. I turned on the nightlight again, turned to her and asked, Will Bill pay for the hotel room tomorrow during the day, or will you? 
Her eyes widened, and she burst into tears. She buried her face in the pillow and continued to cry. I turned off the light and went to sleep. About ten minutes after I turned off the light, Lisa got up and quietly left the bedroom. She didn't come back. She was silent. I did fall asleep eventually, but it took some time. I met Helen for lunch. From her appearance, I could tell that Lisa hadn't spoken to her. We sat at the farthest table from everyone else. We placed our orders, got our drinks, and knew we had twenty minutes until lunch. Thank you for coming. I'm not going to throw Lisa a birthday party. But you said, I lied. I would like to throw her a party, but I can't. Lisa has an affair. I paused. Shock reflected on Helen's face. Don't look so shocked. Not long ago, she asked you to cover for her. Don't answer the phone until I call you on your cell. I didn't know what she was doing. Okay, let's say I believe you. Now that you know that your married sister is cheating, what are you going to do? Are you sure? I have video and audio evidence. Want a copy? Oh my God, I don't know what to do. Today she's meeting her lover at the hotel. Her lover is my former best friend, Bill. I spent some time wondering why until I realized it doesn't matter. What matters is she can't tell me she loves me. What matters is damn Bill is more important than our marriage. There's a for sale sign on the lawn in front of our house. We're done. Our lunch arrived, but we didn't touch a bite. I paid the bill and walked Helen to her car. I know what I'll do now that you've asked. I don't have a sister anymore. She's acting in a way that I don't want her in my family. And tonight, I'm going to talk to Gordon. Talking to you, I see that things aren't right in my house either. She rose on tiptoes and kissed me on the cheek. I held the door for her as she got into her car. Can we stay in touch? You have my number? I nodded. She drove off. I went home and started moving Lisa's things. First, I moved her clothes to another bedroom, then her vanity table. When I pushed her dresser away from the wall, I found a large envelope wedged between the dresser and the wall. Inside were photos of her with Bill at a nudist resort, on her knees somewhere in the yard with Bill. There was also a DVD in the envelope. It was sent to us by mail, and the return address belonged to Bill. Three houses down from us lives Miss Angela McGregor, an attorney. Her car was parked in the driveway when I approached. I handed her a hundred dollar bill. She took it and asked, What's the matter? I think you can spare me fifteen minutes, and that's enough to understand what my divorce will look like. I handed her the envelope. She opened the envelope and peered inside, not touching anything. She looked up and said, Let's talk. My hundred found me a lawyer. She wanted this case. She heard the story and made a few calls. One of the calls was to Lisa's employer. She asked for permission to speak with Lisa. She was told that Lisa had taken sick leave and gone home. Only Lisa wasn't home. I left the envelope with her. I went to the hardware store and bought a lock for the bedroom door. It was installed before Lisa returned home. When she came back, I was sitting at the table. She approached the door and asked if I wanted dinner. No, I think I'm safe for eating out. But thanks for the offer. Did you have a fun day? I'm done with it. Can I ask why? Obviously, you plan to screw him today. Why stop? I want to be married to you. Bullshit. You don't even love me. You'd sooner screw my best friend than be faithful to me. I thought about revenge. I thought about printing a thousand copies of the photos of you screwing around. But then I realized a child might see them, and that would be disgusting. No, it's best to sell the house, split the money, and let you be miserable. She burst into tears and ran down the hallway. She stopped at the bedroom door and saw the new lock. It's locked, she said. She didn't say it to me. She just said it. All your stuff is in the other bedroom. You've moved out while you were with Bill. I heard the door to the other bedroom close, and I didn't see her again that night. At work on Wednesday, Luis asked why I missed yesterday. I started divorce proceedings with my soon-to-be ex-wife. Interesting. Did we talk about this last week? Stop guessing. I caught her. We're done. End of story. As we were having lunch, my cell phone rang. She's been served. Ten minutes later, the phone rang again. I glanced at it, expecting it to be Lisa. It was Helen. He's been served too, she said.
Want to grab dinner and lick our wounds? No, I want to hide somewhere and cry over wasted years. I think our lawyers would advise us to stay away from each other, at least until the divorces are finalized. Mine says we'll be free by Thanksgiving. Let's go on a cruise for Christmas, she laughed. Are you serious? You have six months to make a decision. Until then, take care of yourself. Gordon took the news hard. The day after he was served, he withdrew all the cash from the ATM and stopped by a liquor store, buying enough Jack Daniels for him and three new friends to drink themselves to oblivion. He ended up in the hospital alive. He didn't make it to the divorce and left Helen a widow three days before their anniversary. The day Lisa was served, she called Helen at work. Someone answered, then yelled for Helen. Helen, it's your sister on the phone. That can't be, Helen said. I don't have a sister. I used to, but she's dead. The woman who answered hung up. On the same day, Miss McGregor arranged for a private detective to visit the place where Bill worked. He showed the photos to the CEO and left him a copy. They found a way to let Bill leave the company without severance, without anything. After leaving the office, he never returned to his tiny apartment. No one has seen him since. Well, no one around here. Lisa signed the papers when they were presented to her. They guaranteed her 20% of the sale of the house. On November 10th, I was single. I sold the house in July and lived in the Airstream trailer we bought on vacation until I figured out what to do next. Lisa didn't contact me about the money from the sale of the house. At eight in the evening, someone knocked on my door. I opened it. There stood Helen, in high-heeled shoes, stockings, a short skirt, and a jacket. She looked at me and said, I'm looking for a single man, around forty, divorced, and not objecting to the company of a widow. Maybe I know him. Why don't you come inside and I'll help you find him? Is it warm in there? Warm. It might get even hotter. My hand helped her up the steps, and she stood in the middle of my tiny living room, dining room, and kitchen, waiting for me to help her take off her jacket. I took it off and found that she wasn't wearing a blouse or a bra. I waited, like you said, until you were alone. And now do me a favor. Let's go to bed and figure something out. Right there, in the tiny Airstream trailer, Helen and I kissed for the first time. We had known each other for over fifteen years and were ready to start something. When the kiss ended, I waved my hand, indicating seven feet from where she stood towards the bedroom. Taking a second step in that direction, she opened the fridge. In three seconds, she conducted a full inventory of its contents. Stepping back, she grabbed her jacket and put it on. She took my hand and said, Let's go. We're going to my place. I've got everything we might need. And she was right. 